With so many politicians and activists talking about a climate emergency, you might think scientists have recently discovered something new and ominous about the effects of greenhouse gases. In fact, they've done exactly the opposite. Don't believe me? Stick around. I'm John Robson, and this is a Climate Discussion Nexus Backgrounder on the climate sensitivity question. The whole discussion about climate change ultimately comes down to one question. How sensitive is the climate system to increased greenhouse gas levels? How much does adding CO2 to the atmosphere cause temperature to rise, weather to change, or anything else? If climate is very sensitive to CO2, everything we do matters. If it's not, well, there's no cause to panic. What scientists have been trying to estimate is called equilibrium climate sensitivity, or ECS. It means the average warming that will happen around the world after doubling the amount of CO2 in the air, once all of Earth's complex climate systems have fully responded. In our video on the simple physics slogan, we learned why it's so difficult to make such estimates. In climate models, as in reality, CO2 doesn't cause much warming directly. Most of the supposed effect comes through feedback from whatever warming CO2 does cause, feedback involving changes in clouds, water vapor, wind patterns, ocean currents, and so on, all of which are highly uncertain, hard to predict, and feedback on one another. So what have scientists found, or at least tried to find? Back in the 1890s, Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius made the first attempts to estimate the Earth's ECS. He figured it was around 5 degrees Celsius, plus or minus 1 degree. It's a very high number. But the topic attracted relatively little attention for the next 80 years, until it became an issue that fossil fuel use was pushing the atmospheric CO2 content upwards. Then, in 1979, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences published a report written by MIT's Jewel Charney and a group of co-authors. Based on early computer simulations, they suggested ECS was likely around 3 degrees Celsius, plus or minus 1.5 degrees. Given their range of uncertainty, it could be as low as 1.5, which isn't very serious, or as high as 4.5 degrees, which is serious. And actually, a follow-up study by the National Academy in 1983 leaned toward the low end. The climate record of the past 100 years and our estimates of CO2 changes over that period suggests that values in the lower half of this range are more probable. That 1979 finding, the so-called Charney range of 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius, has bounded ECS estimates ever since. It was reaffirmed in the 1983 report of the U.S. National Academy, and then repeatedly reaffirmed over the next 30 years by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. The suggestion that it's near the low end hasn't exactly been the main focus, but it's right there in the report. So, what mainstream climate science actually says is that doubling atmospheric CO2 might well cause a temperature increase of around one and a half degrees, in which case the effects will be small and we shouldn't worry much. Of course, it might be on the high end, above 4.5 degrees, in which case there will be problems. But interestingly, the models also say that if climate sensitivity is high, the effects will take longer to arrive. The higher ECS turns out to be, the slower the warming. So what it all boils down to is that according to the conventional wisdom, at least in its fine print, the bigger the problem, the more time we have to adjust. Which in turn means the idea of a climate emergency in which CO2 causes dramatic changes to happen fast is not mainstream science at all. It's unscientific alarmist fear-mongering. And that's not all. As it turns out, science hasn't told us sensitivity is high nor have semi-scientific, semi-political bodies like the IPCC. Over the years, the IPCC accepted the broad Charney range for ECS, but they didn't necessarily accept Charney and his colleagues' three-degree best estimate. In 1990, they proposed a slightly lower best estimate of 2.5 degrees. In their 2007 report, they raised it to three degrees, 
But in 2013, they dropped the best estimate altogether, saying they could no longer agree on what it was. So, the end result of hundreds of scientists developing dozens of large-scale climate models at a cost of tens of billions of dollars over 35 years, beginning in 1979, was an admission that they were less certain at the end than they were when they started. Which is not itself a bad thing. If scientists are getting unclear results, they deserve credit for saying so instead of feigning omniscience. What is a bad thing is that while scientific uncertainty was actually increasing, political rhetoric was going in the opposite direction. By 2013, governments everywhere were feigning omniscience and displaying genuine bad manners, telling us the science was settled and heaping abuse on anyone who dared suggest that climate change isn't an evidence-based, fast-motion catastrophe. But where is the evidence? It's important to remember that these estimates of climate sensitivity didn't come from observing the actual climate. They came from examining how climate models behave. But the whole point of the vaunted modern scientific method is that you test theories against evidence. So in 2002, a group of scientists proposed a way of doing so, of estimating ECS based on real-world data, not free-floating computer simulations. These researchers' way of using observations of temperature, CO2 levels, and other climate variables in a statistical model to estimate ECS directly has come to be called the energy balance method. It isn't completely independent of climate models, but it has the advantage of requiring the resulting ECS estimate to be consistent with historical data. Initially, the energy balance estimates were very high, over six degrees Celsius with an uncertainty range going to infinity, which if true would certainly indicate a looming climate crisis. But the early authors cautioned that they didn't have all the data they needed, especially for the world's oceans. And they therefore used creative extrapolation to fill in the gaps. It took another 10 years for the necessary data sets to be assembled. Once they were, a series of studies began to appear, starting in 2012, from numerous independent teams estimating ECS using the energy balance method and similar approaches with more complete data. And what they showed is remarkable. And now, a word from our sponsor. And that's you, because the Climate Discussion Nexus is supported by ordinary Canadians who want to see more common sense, more logic, and more facts in the discussion on climate change and less yelling. If you want to help us, subscribe to our YouTube channel, go to our Patreon page, make a pledge, become a monthly sponsor. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Here's the Charney best estimate and the uncertainty range for ECS that models have stayed within since the 1970s. And here are a dozen data-driven ECS best estimates published from 2012 to 2018. They are all clustered down at the low end of the range. The clear implication from these newer data-driven studies is that climate sensitivity in the real world is only about half the average level in climate models. And while the energy balance model is still a work in progress, with each new study, the authors have taken account of various methodological criticisms and shown that revising the approach doesn't really change the pattern. This 2018 paper by Nicholas Lewis and Judith Curry, published in the American Meteorological Society's Journal of Climate, is particularly important because it applies the energy balance method to the IPCC's own data sets, while taking account of all known criticisms of that method. And it yields one of the lowest ECS estimates to date, 1.5 degrees, right at the bottom of the Charney range. Looks like the National Academy's conjecture in 1983 was right. ECS values in the bottom half of the range are more probable. Another important line of evidence for low sensitivity has emerged from the study of the atmosphere over the tropics. Climate models predict that this is the region where we should see the strongest effects of CO2. Yet there's been very little warming there since records began in the late 1950s. A study published in 2017 examined 40 years of data from weather satellites and once again concluded that historical warming is consistent with a climate sensitivity only about half as big as the climate model average. Thank you.
Back in 2007, the IPCC claimed, based on their models, that ECS was, quote, very unlikely, end quote, to be less than 1.5 degrees. But 10 years later, using the IPCC's own data, Lewis and Curry found that there's a 50% probability that ECS is below 1.5 degrees. They concluded, quote, high estimates of ECS derived from a majority of climate models are inconsistent with observed warming during the historical period, end quote. So, the next time anyone asks you whether you, quote, believe the science, end quote, tell them the real question is whether you believe the models or the evidence. You can believe one or the other, but not both because they contradict each other. Or at least, most models contradict the evidence. And the ones that don't are also the ones that show very little warming from CO2. And alarmist claims about a climate emergency aren't based on data or science. At best, they're based on models known to be inconsistent with reality, and at worst, they're made up out of thin, hot air. Join the conversation online at climatediscussionnexus.com, subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook, and if you want to see more content like this video, visit our Patreon page and become a supporter. For the Climate Discussion Nexus, I'm John Robson.